Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another weekly episode of Everything Vaguely Paranormal. As always, I am Blake Smith, and with me are my partners in the paranormal, Miss Shelley Pruitt, Mr. Ryan Roberts. How are y'all doing? <laughs> I'm doing great tonight. We've had a little excitement mm -hmm. over the weekend, lots of crazy <laughs> weather, and a solar eclipse. Yay, us. Yay, we survived. <laughs> the, uh, what, we is, did. what is that Chinese proverb? May you always live in interesting times. However, yeah, I'm over the interesting times, right? <laughs> I don't mean to brag yeah. or anything, but this is like my 10th end of the world that I've survived. So, what are you telling? I mean, <laughs> right? I feel like I'm doing pretty damn good so far. So, <laughs> y'all, I, I shit you not. I had somebody come to me yesterday and talk about like, I don't know, man, that solar eclipse is happening. Maybe that mind calendar was off and it's actually happening now. I was like, mind calendar? That's an old one. <laughs> like you're dusting off some old conspiracy theories for that one. It's been about a decade past that, yeah. my friend. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> But who knows? Maybe this uh, maybe this chick that we'll be talking about tonight, maybe she's the end of our world. Who knows? You know, who knows? Because I, to, go ahead, Ryan. I'll say, I will say this. It is a dark and stormy night down here in Austin. So it is perfect to hear a good story about an urban legend this evening. Oh, well, I've got a great one for you. And let me tell you, my friend, she is all around your area. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Ooh. So enjoy that late night stroll after I tell you this wonderful little story. Uh, okay. Yes, tonight we're going to be talking about one of my favorite stories that there is out there. We are going to be talking about La Llorona. Okay. If you have no idea who she is. What, Ryan? I so you I have, a, you, you have a bunch of people right now who are going, who's La Llorona? <laughs> <laughs> well, That's we are. Correct pronunciation, I know. shall we? <laughs> we are from Texas. And so uh -huh. I will go ahead and preface this episode that I've been practicing these names and places that I'm going to be saying tonight for couple of days now. Um, right. But remember, I am from Texas and we have shitty accents anyways. So, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you're making an effort to do that correct pronunciation. You're trying not to do the Peggy Hill Spanish. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is true. This is true. Well, I'm going to dive right in because I'm fascinated by this lady and I am ready to hear what y'all have to say about her. So, okay. From the banks of the rivers in Mexico in the southwestern portion of the United States, there lies a tale of a woman in white. The short fable of the woman is one of the best known legendary creatures of Latin America and among Spanish speaking communities. No ghost story is discussed as enthusiastically or told as often as that of the mythical account of the weeping woman in white, or she is more widely known as La Llorona. La Llorona's tr literal translation is the crybaby. So it's no surprise <laughs> that the main characteristic shared by all variations of her story is that she weeps. La Llorona is both myth and cautionary tale, urban legend and folklore, the proverbial boogeyman and real-life horror story. However, she also plays quite a pivotal role within Spanish-speaking communities, as many are told to be sure to be home before the sun goes down, especially after the rain. La Llorona not only has a connection to the water through her actions of drowning her own children in the river, but also is said to appear three days after rainstorms come through. She falls within the category of monsters such as the Vodnoi from Slavic Europe, Jenny Greenteeth, my favorite, by the way, of England, <laughs> and mermaids, all luring and dragging unsuspecting victims to a watery grave. Now, I'm going to sit here and freaking tell you, when I came across Jenny Greenteeth, I'm going to deviate from La Llorona real quick. Because I when like, I heard... <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen, if I die and have to come back as a monster, yeah. and that's the fucking name I'm given... Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, haunt. We're haunting I'm gonna haunt <laughs> Just, everybody's ass. <laughs> Oi, you wanna get in the water? <laughs> and that, folks, is how we got canceled in England. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> well, in its simplest form, La Llorona's tell is one to keep children from going down to the river by themselves to keep them from drowning. Right. Ca cautionary tell. Yeah. yeah. For if they do, La Llorona will be waiting there for them, ready to take them away pull them under, rip them to shreds with her claws, or worse, eat them right there on the spot. This sounds a lot like a topic we covered a few weeks ago, Slender Man, ready to take them away to some mystical mm. place. Why do they always got to be snatching kids? <laughs> Well, because I think that that's where a lot of the, I mean, why you got to uh -huh. like train your kids with these monsters to not do things, you know, and parents, right. you just, you just want to break. I get it. But I mean, damn, telling them that <laughs> some woman's going to come snatch them and rip them to shreds. I mean, 
She had. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of half the fun of being a parent, though. You get to scare the crap out of your children. This is true. This is true. Speaking from experience, it's really good to mess with them. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, there is no way of knowing the full number of variations to the narrative of La Llorona. Every mm -hmm. city has a different woman. Every neighborhood has a different detail. And every family passes along a new and terrifying ending. But this story doesn't stop at children. La Llorona's fatal wells have been said to affect teenagers, drunken men, and lustful youngsters alike. Now, can you, can you imagine Lustful that? Like, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Can you imagine though? Like you've gone, you've picked up your date. It's a hot date. You're looking good. You got your cologne on or your perfume <laughs> on or whatever. You're just looking for a little nookie new and you go to, I don't know. Nookie some, new. Yeah. <laughs> nookie new, my friend. <laughs> nookie new. And you go to like some parking lot where you're about to like get it on or whatnot. And then uh -huh. there's this bitch <laughs> standing outside <laughs> your fucking window. <laughs> you mean, got some for me? <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Casing She's not, this strangely is, at a lustful youngster. This, this isn't Jeannie Green Teeth, Ryan. It's okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. La Llorona. <laughs> <laughs> well, stories of weeping female phantoms are common in folklore, as mm -hmm. are the ladies in white. But La right. Llorona's story is far more complicated and widely disputed. It is a tale of a woman scorned and love lost, an epic narrative that mixes the brutality of war, famine, loyalty, and vengeance. Now, if you were to do a simple Google search for La Llorona, you would receive a vast array of stories and variations. There are those who argue that the narrative originated within indigenous cultures prior to the Spanish arrival in Mexico, while others contend that it emerged as a consequence of the Spanish colonization. But according to the accepted legend, I'm going to tell you kind of the accepted legend. I mean, as I said, there's there's no definitive right. story to this, but this is the more widely accepted mm -hmm. version of it. Um, La Llorona was once a beautiful woman named Maria who was having an affair with a Spanish, Spanish gentleman. Now, from this relationship, she bore him three children. Now, some sources say two. I actually found a few that said up to five. Mm -hmm. However, there is always at least two. Okay. So while this couple fell more madly in love with one another, they had to remain a secret from society, as in most versions, she was not of his nobility. So their wow. time of affection unfolded amidst like deceit and, you know, this obscurity that they mm -hmm. had to they had to stand her but they were in different class systems so it was kind of like star-crossed lovers could right be yeah together could okay. not be together so yeah they had to meet in secret and all that stuff well having started their family the woman maria aimed to secure a stable father figure for her children which prompted her to request formal commitment from the spaniard however being of higher social standing he often evaded this request from her perhaps due to you know societal judgment and all that stupid shit now right well, following the woman's persistent request and the man's ongoing refusal, he eventually left her to wed a woman of Spanish high society. Upon learning of this, Maria was completely devastated and deeply hurt by the sense of deception and betrayal. So in her desperation, she brought her three children to the river's edge, embracing them one final time to signify her love before tragically drowning them. Really quick, just so I know yes. the, the legend, she already had these children, and these were children of the Spaniard. No, these these were children of the couple, the, of her uh, okay. and the couple, of her and the oh, Spaniard. Okay. Yes, okay, the okay, Spanish okay. gentleman. So this okay. this was their children. All right, okay. Well, afterwards, consumed by guilt and torment, she ended up taking her own life by drowning herself, haunted by the weight of her conscience. Now, in she should have started with herself, <laughs> left them kids alone. Yeah. <laughs> or she could have drowned the Spaniard. <laughs> That's a better option. There you yes. Go. <laughs> well, in one so in one of the sources, the story continues that when Maria ascended to heaven and stood before the pearly gate, St. Peter asked her where her children were. And she mm. simply and deceitfully said, I don't know. I ain't got a clue. But of course, St. Peter already knew this. Wait, she lied to the angels. Like they didn't already mm -hmm. see all right. that crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, of course, St. Peter already knew this. So he ends up cursing her back to earth with the task of locating the remains of her slain children as La Llorona, perpetually crying and lamenting by the riversides of Mexico and Texas until she discovers the children's bones. Now, I did actually find a couple of the things that said she's actually made it as far north as I believe it's like Montana 
uh, and okay. Wisconsin. Like there have been reports of La Llorona as far north as that. Okay. But it really is kind of this southwestern region of the United States. It's not just Mexico and Texas. Um, but, okay. you know, Arizona and New Mexico, California, you know, all of those kind of southern, southwestern states of the United States. But as far as you know, the original legend from what you can gather originates in Texas. No, the original legend, which we'll get into here just a little bit, uh, it actually comes from Mexico. Oh, OK, OK. Is where it comes cool. from, okay. you know, all and right. then, of course, you have immigrants coming over and bringing their right. folklore, traditions, cultures, all right. that. With and then them. you have. And, people fanning out in the United States doing the same thing. Right. Gotcha. Right. So, I mean, it's really not weird. It's like, why the bitch all the way up in Montana, you know, that's but, what I was going to say. I'm right. like, she got a bad sense of direction. <laughs> no wonder she can't find those kids. Like, the bones ain't up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are those who have stated they've witnessed her wandering in anguish, her cries echoing profound sorrow and remorse for her children. Her guilt torments her relentlessly, giving her no respite. And in some sources, it's actually stated that the bones of her children are buried within her own back, though she may never find them. So she's just doomed to wander for all eternity because she can't ever find their bones. Okay. Kate. Yeah. Yeah, I read that and I was like, damn, that's a fucked up that's side pretty, of that story. That's pretty fucking <laughs> <laughs> Well, from here, the different variations kind of take over. Mm -hmm. Now, in some stories, she's said to wail for her loss or her dead children. In others, she appears only to women who have children and okay. steals them, mistaking them for her own. She is said to appear when children misbehave and is used to keep children from staying out too late uh, or when men are alone near lakes and, river, uh, lakes and rivers. Um, she's also used to dissuade children just from completely misbehaving instead of appearing after they misbehave. And in turn becomes this ultimate, if you want to cry, I'll give you something to cry about, you know, type thing. So mm -hmm. it's like, if you cry too much, you're going to, you're going to bring La Llorona in. She's the ultimate right. cry baby, you know, and after all. I, I actually like, have heard, have heard uh, one of my friends who, who, who is from Mexico actually threatened her children that La Llorona is going to get you if you don't stop crying. I have actually heard that. <laughs> that is 100% accurate. Yeah. Well, and it's it's parent from what I understood from a lot of the stories that I was able to read right. is that parents are like, hey, stop crying. She's going to get you. Look what she did to her children. Now think what she'll do to you. It's the boogeyman. It's yeah. the same concept. It's the yeah. boogeyman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The crap that floats around in the dark. And in other <laughs> stories still, she simply just kidnaps <laughs> children who are never seen again. Now, at times in the La Llorona encounter, she catches sight of you in the distance and gives chase instilling terror as you rush back to the safety of your own. Occasionally, she's manifested while riding a horse. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. There's all these different variations of this. Suddenly, there... she's a damn equestrian? <laughs> <laughs> I say, are there rules to her? Kind of like how, like, uh, you know, like she has to kind of stay close to a river. Or she can't cross a certain point. Apparently, so, she can ride on her horseback somewhere. But, 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 I mean, it could be along the riverbed. We there don't know. Is always from everything that i could tell all the stories that i've read everything that i came across of the research that i did there is always some sort of element of water nearby okay maybe there's a lake or there's a river or there's even like a water drain ditch that somebody lives next to okay where it's been a massive rainstorm and it's kind of flooded everywhere okay there go is... for la llorona because that's what <laughs> right outside my house i know shit <laughs> Especially with all the rain we've been having here in Texas, <laughs> being in her backyard, basically. Um, but other times she materializes in your car, cautioning against wrongdoing before vanishing. Very reminiscent of another famous specter, the right. vanishing hitchhiker. Right. Yeah. And in other more morbid accounts, an encounter with her proves deadly. Described as a vengeful and sinister entity, La Llorona purportedly acts ruthlessly and without hesitation or compassion, frequently drowning the children she has taken or abducted upon discovering they are not her own. According to certain beliefs, in a form of revenge, she will seduce a lone man, murdering him for her husband's betrayal. Or, well, her, I guess her fiance, or boyfriend's, the gentleman's her, betrayal. Right, right. Yeah. 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 He's a substitute. Yes. Yeah. So she'll, sed she'll seduce a lone man and then right. kill him for, for that betrayal. So <clears throat> this is kind of reminiscent of a story, Ryan, in your area. Okay. Uh, of the legend of the donkey lady in Austin, Texas. Now right. I know, I know before everybody jumps all over That's me, what I, was I know say. the story originates in San Antonio. 
I know this. Donkey Lady well aware. down there. Yeah. But just like La Llorona, Donkey Lady has a bunch of different variations as well. Now, this okay. variation happens in Austin, Texas. Uh, and in this tale, uh, this grieving and sorrowful Donkey Lady was said to stalk frat boys on 6th Street, where she would eventually drag them to a watery grave for any mistreatment of women that she saw. Now, trust me, I have seen some things on 6th Street. The Donkey Lady is not too far-fetched. <laughs> <laughs> But wait, okay, but here's my question. Y'all had some guys disappearing down there not too long ago. And they Still are do. being pulled. They're, 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 one today actually was pulled out of Lady Bird Lake. Are you serious? I am dead still serious. Happening. It's still happening. Still happening. Still wow. happening. Absolutely. So it's either, uh, La, it's either La Llorona or the Donkey Lady or y'all have a serial killer. Uh, possibly. Who knows? Now, if, wow. now is that interestingly seven? enough, is though. Is that seven? Uh, that's, I don't know what the total count is at this point, but they just pulled one out today. Um, interestingly enough, though, I will say is there actually is a creek that runs through downtown Austin on 6th Street called Waller Creek. So that mm -hmm. makes sense. That tracks for her being around there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to reconfirm. It is the donkey lady for all of y'all throwing it, <laughs> throwing up the donkey lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and other beliefs uh, or other beliefs suggest she indiscriminately slays men, women and children alike. We're back to La Llorona now. Okay, But all variations share that same prominent trait of her sorrowful wails and long white dress. Now, eerily enough, her wails are said to get more distant the closer she stalks her victims. I found that kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Bess Lomax Haas's classic paper, go ahead, Ryan. There, there is an old adage as far as like those types of creatures. If it, if, if it sounds far away, it's very close. If it sounds far away, it's, it's, sorry, if it sounds far away, it's close. If it sounds yeah. close, it's far. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's well, all backwards. Well, according to Bess Lomax Haas's classic paper, La Llorona and Juvenile mm -hmm. Hall, she sometimes takes the form of this beautiful siren tempting a solitary mm -hmm. man late at night. She is this pitiful, woe-begone figure hidden under a heavy shawl, just weeping. And when this man offers his assistance, she turns and he is met with either a bare skull, a metallic horse head, or no face at all. Completely void of eyes, nose, and mouth. Metallic horse head? <laughs> yes, metallic Does she horse have head. a blacksmith shop? Where did she fashion <laughs> that? I don't know. I wasn't able to trace that one down. <laughs> okay. It's just one of the things that it said. All right. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, the no face thing to me is what terrifies me the most. Like, you right. remember that, that interrogation scene out of The Matrix, like, where his mouth starts to, like, melt yeah. together? Uh-huh. Oh, that crap just freaks me out. So imagine just basically, if you will, like no eyes, no nose, no, just a blank face is mm. what these guys see. Interesting. Fucking terrifying. Yeah, that would have scared the bejesus <laughs> out of me. Absolutely. Well, since years have passed since La Llorona took her own children's lives and began her wailing, her eyes are now marked with the scars where the tears have fallen. Mm. Some say she has no more tears to give, that her eyes are said to be stained and drip blood possibly the blood of her own children. Her hair hasn't stopped growing either. It is now a tangled and knotted mess that wraps around her, her body, while her ever-growing nails have become claws to help her dredge the sandy bottoms of the rivers and streams for her children. Her flowing white dress, some sources stating it a wedding dress, has now become soiled, dirty, and stained from the years of wandering through desolate streets, watery canals, and the muddy rivers. Now, in other stories of La Llorona, she even appears as a fiery ball of flames with the ability to produce smoke and sparks from her nostrils. Hmm. But in, <laughs> I'm telling y'all, there's like every it's remember like what I she's said. She's the dragon lady now. Remember right. every, what I said. Every family adds this new terrifying in. Right. You know, some mom was like, "How mm -hmm. can I really fuck my child up and get them in therapy <laughs> later on?" Oh. Fiery ball of flames, <laughs> and and it, it is that urban legend thing. There, like the story yeah. is all pretty much the same, but there's these different inflections and not inflections. Right. These different things that people add, and these different Through things world that tradition, absolutely right. or tradition that always picks up something different as it goes along. Correct. Mm -hmm. But in all iterations of the La Llorona tale, she must be avoided at all cost. Now, of course, La Llorona is not the only one of her kind. There have been several entities from across the globe that she has been compared right. and even linked to, starting with the Banshee in Irish folklore, which mm -hmm. is a female spirit associated with mourning and death. This Banshee is depicted as a screaming woman, foretelling the death of a family member and evoking a sense of sorrow and foreboding. 
She typically appears dressed in white or gray with long flowing hair and piercing red eyes and is known for her mournful wails, just like La Llorona, except for the piercing red eyes. I didn't find that. <laughs> Although it could be somewhere in some neighborhood. I, somewhere, yeah. <laughs> so, Some family, she's got red eyes. One branch of the creek's got red eyes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, another entity is the woman in white. Though this entity lacks cultural specificity, I have to say that in syllables, sorry. <laughs> Unlike La Llorona, <laughs> both figures share thematic similarities, such as their ethereal appearance and association with, association with death or despair. Mm -hmm. uh, this spirit is typically portrayed as innocent, pure, or the sufferer of a tragic lo love. And we know of one very close to home, which is the Lady of White Rock Lake. Right. Which we know is not only a lady and a woman in white, but she's also a vanishing hitchhiker. Mm -hmm. So she's got an interesting story. We'll probably tell you all that on Patreon at some point. It's real short. Not enough for an episode. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, there's the snow woman from Japanese folklore who is associated with winter and death. This entity, like La Llorona, is often depicted as a beautiful but malevolent spirit who preys on unsuspecting victims, particularly travel travelers caught in snowstorms. Both legends embody the fear of encountering otherworldly entities in desolate or remote locations and the vulnerability of human existence. While well, scouring the internet, one is able to find several firsthand accounts with La Llorona herself. I'm going to give you all a couple of these because some of these I read them and I was like, Burr. like my, <laughs> my eyebrows went raised and everything. <laughs> well, on a Reddit thread, a tale entitled She is Real, a La Llorona Experience by DJ Underdog 85 goes as follows. Quote, one night, just like any other night, I lived in a trailer with my mom and dad. My youngest brother was staying with my aunt this night. I fell asleep watching Jay Leno as usual. And when I woke up, I was on the sofa in my living room. By the way, this is like the 90s. Uh, I was going to say Jay Leno yeah. might be the <laughs> yeah. thing in the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the time was 4 a.m., which illuminated from the stove in the kitchen. The television was off, and normally I had a light on, but this time it was pitch black. I woke up and heard a horrible screaming that was coming from far in the distance. The screaming was coming from a ditch that was a few feet away from my house. I heard it, and I thought it was hearing things. I asked myself, am I dreaming? Then I started to hear the animals outside howling and whimpering. These animals that I speak of are cats and dogs. As the screaming got closer, the animals continued to cry. The screaming was something I had never experienced ever before. It sounded like I was in a big hallway and a woman was screaming her guts out down the hallway. Then in all the screaming, I started to make out words. The words being said by whoever this was at 4 a.m. screaming shocked me. The woman said, ah, mis hijos. That's about as good as you're going to get me to wail. Or, oh, my children. In a huge panic, I quickly got up from the sofa and ran to the kitchen, which was right next to where I was sleeping. I turned the closet light on and looked around. The screaming didn't stop. In fact, the screaming only got louder and closer. Mm -mm. I questioned my sanity at the moment. Was I going crazy or hearing things? Then I thought to myself, this is real, and the animals are responding to it in a negative way. So I did what any other boy would do in a moment like this. I ran to my mom and dad's room. I reached <laughs> for my mom. Exactly. Mama. I, yep, exactly. That's, <laughs> I reached for my mom and shook her awake wildly. She woke up slowly and to my amazement, the screaming faded away as she woke awake. I thought to myself, what the heck is going on? I told my mother, mom, do you hear that? The screaming and crying lady. My mom was half asleep as she said, go back to sleep. It's, um, it's most likely just your imagination. And I told her, no, this is real. Please listen. Don't you hear her? My mom quickly just said, you're dreaming, so go back to sleep. It's going to be okay. By then, the screaming... Clearly, I'm faded. not. I'm shaking your ass awake. Help me. <laughs> By then, the screaming had faded long, long away, like it, if whoever was screaming knew that an adult was awake. I was terrified as I returned to the living room and quickly turned on the television as I left most of the lights on as well. I didn't go back to sleep until, until the sun came up. I couldn't believe what I had heard and witnessed. I'm sorry. But if I wake up in the middle of the night at 4 a.m. and I hear this shit, well, first off, I'm going to think Bobcat. That's just me. But <laughs> then be like, oh, there's a Bobcat outside. That's how La is going right. to be. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, it's just a Bobcat. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a Bobcat saying my children. <laughs> I don't know. No, yeah, I don't think they're going to be like, ah, mis Dios. <laughs> but, okay, did he say that he lived... 
I mean, was it, was it, did it say if the trailer was isolated or if it was in like a, a trailer park no, or anything? He never, he never said, uh, he just said it was next to a ditch and you asked about the water, you know, portion mm -hmm. of it. So yeah, he was next to basically like this drainage ditch is where okay. he, he kind of grew up on that. So that was his account. Now another okay. tale. Noisy neighbors. <laughs> right. <laughs> now another tale from me too, not me too, the movement, but M I T U. Okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Author. N. M. Nurse tells their story as follows. Okay. Quote, my mom was 10 years old and lived next to a small ditch next to a highway. She stayed at her friend's house, which was a little closer to the ditch. The day went normal, riding bikes, playing typical girl stuff. Then night came, and they knew it was time to get home once the streetlights came on. They were sitting at the friend's bedroom, radio on, listening to music and playing a card game. It was already dark out, and the music from the stereo filled the room. Now, my mom's friend lived with her mom and grandma, who both spoke fluent Spanish. My mom understood it, but could not speak it. My mom developed this overwhelming sense of anxiety and terror out of nowhere. Then, it started crying. The girls both heard it, but brushed it off as a cat or a drunken neighbor, which I probably would too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Soon, the crying began to become louder and more obnoxious, like it wanted to be heard. The girls paused what they were doing, staring at the window. Once they looked that way, the, gr the crying became ear-splitting, so loud it resonated over the stereo. Both girls Oof. had hands over their ears, fearful of what was happening. The grandma burst in the room, holy water in one hand and rosary in the other. She was <laughs> yeah. screaming, screaming over the crying and praying in Spanish. <laughs> hey, on the way, dear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Miss Doubtfire, come on. <laughs> come on now. <laughs> <laughs> my mom says that when she <laughs> sorry my mom says that when she did this the radio started to static and the lights began to flicker mm -hmm. both the crying and the praying booming extremely loud until it all went quiet it all stopped the grandma said a prayer over my mom and her granddaughter and made them go into the living room instructing them not to return to that room for the night and not to look out the window my mom returned home in the morning, not speaking of what had happened. And even when she tells a story now, an overwhelming sense of fear takes over and she gets the goosebumps. So those are kind of like two firsthand yeah. accounts that I was able to find that really, I, I don't know, like encapsulates all that we've discussed so far. Right, right. You know, with the water next to the ditch, with the wailing and the getting closer and the fading away and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I'm telling y'all though, I'm sorry. If I the first thing I'm gonna think is Bobcat, and that's how she's gonna right, get me. So I'm gonna go out to check and make sure that the Bobcat's not in danger. It's either her or the Bobcat's gonna get me, one of the two. But <laughs> <laughs> you're muted, Shelly. Oh, I'm sorry. I muted myself. I was like, not me. Screw that Bobcat. It's fine. It's got claws <laughs> and fangs, and yeah, it, it'll be all right. I'll just try to pet it and it'll probably get me. <laughs> no, that Bobcat will be fine. It survived in the wild mm -hmm. this long. Right. Yeah, no shit. Well, regardless of the version of La Llorona and individual encounters, truth is, is that her beginning was so long ago that no one truly knows the origin of her creation. All they do know is that when she was alive as a living woman, she committed many sins. The legend has many different origin stories. All right. So this is the part where we're going to get into a little bit of history of Mexico and Aztec mythology. Aztec mythology is gruesome and fascinating. And fun. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. yeah. Well, these stories are going to encompass tales featuring captivating women, fearsome creatures, and, as some accounts suggest, the betrayal of an entire society. Okay. Oh, yes. La Llorona is a lot more complicated than you thought. Now, I don't think it's any surprise, or maybe you've forgotten, that Aztec mythology and belief systems are deeply intertwined with violence, reflecting the harsh realities of their society and worldview. One of the most prominent features of Aztec belief was the practice of sacrificial rituals in particular, human sacrifice. Now, I'm going to say, did they practice this? Yes. Was it every day and barbaric as like the history books? No, no. it probably wasn't. I mean, it's barbaric, no. yes, but the practice itself. But it wasn't like every day they're just slaughtering people left and right. No, you know? not at all. So you, usually it's captives from warfare or other means that are often used as like offerings to appease the gods and the goddesses to ensure mm -hmm. that this continued harmony uh, of the around cosmos. harvest times, around right. solstices, uh, right. around eclipses. Right. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this violence is also seen in Aztec's mythological narratives that oftentimes depict cosmic struggles between opposing forces. 
It's again reflected in the Aztec cosmology, which was shaped by belief in cyclical time and the constant struggle between life and death. Violent rituals were seen as essential for renewing the life force of the universe and preventing its descent into chaos. But the question is, why don't we know more about these portions of the Aztec culture? Well, history is rarely, if never, written by the losers or the losing <laughs> side. <laughs> And the Aztecs were eventually conquered by the Spanish. Most of their ideology was, was changed to make the Aztecs appear as barbaric as possible. Mm -hmm. This led to the destruction of many Aztec religious sites, temples, manuscripts, as well as the suppression of indigenous religious practices. Anything that survived of Aztec rituals and beliefs were written by Spanish invaders and missionaries who often had a biased perspective shaped by Christianity. So there was this overwhelming interest in documenting aspects of the Aztecs. Ah, made a rhyme. Uh, culture that they found <laughs> shocking or morally reprehensible, such as the human sacrifice. And they eventually demonized all the go Aztec gods and goddesses. And they took these aspects of the Aztec culture and told them that, hey, what you've been, you know, worshiping to your entire existence, that, hey, that's a demon. And what you need to do instead is worship this one singular god. I mean, that was their whole thing, convert mm -hmm. to Christianity. Right. Well, this end result was this new encyclopedia, quote unquote, or guide, if you will, for future missionaries that basically labeled out all these, quote, Aztec demons, which were just their gods and goddesses. Now, on top of this, much of Aztec religious knowledge was transmitted orally through ritual ceremonies and oral traditions passed down through generations. Well, the Spanish conquest led to many of these oral traditions being lost or fragmented, which leads to gaps in our understanding of Aztec religion and culture. Now, saying all of that, there is a reason, I promise. <laughs> Part of the Aztec culture has survived through the tale of La Llorona, particularly the ritual of blood sacrifice to the goddess Coatlicue. Again, this is where that Texas accent is going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> Often depicted as a fearsome goddess associated with fertility, life, death, and rebirth, Coatlicue is a central deity in Aztec mythology. She's what some call the Great Mother and is partly responsible for the creation of the world alongside Quetzalcoatl. According to a Texas Monthly article, Coatli Q has been depicted wearing a long dress of tangled rivers and drowning men. Mm. And that's the thing that I love about Aztec astrology is just how violent it truly is kind of depicted. So, however, I think that that's a misconception, though, that it leads like, oh, they had all this violent ideology. So they're violent people or a violent society. And again, right. not necessarily true. I mean, we'll look at look at Greek, Greek mythology. It's the same oh. thing. Like, I mean, it's extremely violent. Greek, but it's Greek extremely interesting. Roman, right. uh, just keep on going, you know. Right. Not saying that the people who practice it were violent, just the actual right. stories themselves. Because what is a good story without conflict? Yeah, I mean, everybody loves a good story. It's why we right. drink. Nobody likes a story that's like, hey, one time I was eating a salad. You yeah, know, right. I mean, everybody likes a good story. Let history... me tell you about the best night of sleep I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> well, and history is written by the victors. You know, we've right. already covered that. So, well, Kowatli Q is often depicted in a monstrous form as a dual headed serpent. She is adorned with a skirt of writhing snakes and a necklace made of human hearts, hands, and skulls. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I love this shit. Mm -hmm. Well, her feet and hands are adorned with claws, and her breasts are depicted as hanging flaccid from pregnancy. Now, in some descriptions of Coatlicue, she has a daughter named Siwa Coatl. In other variations, Siwa Coatl is just an aspect of Coatlicue or another depiction, if you will. But for our story, we are going to stick with the narrative that the two are separate and that Siwa Coatl is Coatlicue's daughter, as in most of the research I have found, they are two separate entities. Okay. So that's the narrative we're going to stick with for this. It, ahead, is Brian. it kind of like, you know, like we're like... It's the same God, but there's different parts of the same God. Is that kind of the same? Yeah, thing? that's kind of okay. the understanding that I was getting. Like now, I haven't done like a deep dive into Aztec mythology or anything like that. Okay, you know, I really dove deep onto this aspect of it, the connection with La Llorona. Mm -hmm. Um, but the overall consensus I could understand is that yes, some of them have like you want to call it different faces, mm -hmm. call it different faces. You know, right? So they're depicted differently. Okay. Um, but these two I found in most of the research were were separate. And one was mother, one was daughter. Kuala okay. was the mother. Siwa Kawada was the daughter. Well, although, <laughs> excuse me, although there are several narratives to this story, in one of the many Aztec myths, Siwa Kawada, the goddess of motherhood and fertility, is the one who assisted Quetzalcoatl in fashioning the present human race by pulverizing the bones of the people of the past and combining them with his blood. <laughs> Love it. Hell so, yeah. <laughs> I know. Once this action was complete, another of Kuala daughters, 
Koyo Zalqui rallied her siblings and led them in an attack to kill and decapitate their mother. Reason being is very reminiscent of La Llorona. Because you see, Kowatleku was in fact pregnant by another man who was not the father of the siblings, which infuriated Koyo Zalqui. Oh, damn, this is ancient Mori. <laughs> this is ancient Mori, yes. Well, as the story goes, after Kowatleku was murdered, the offspring that was the result of the affair, sprung forth from her bloody neck stub, fully grown, armed, and ready to retaliate. Now, some sources do state he sprung from her womb before she was killed after hearing of an impending attack in utero. <laughs> yes, I love it. Nice. This Baby child... come out swinging. <laughs> <laughs> this child was Huitzilopochtli, which is the god of war. Now, Huitzilopochtli, seeing his slain mother, became enraged and began dismembering hundreds of his siblings in retaliation for their actions. One of those siblings in particular was the moon goddess, Coil Zalqui, whom he himself decapitated and threw her head into the sky. Her head remains hanging there to this day as what we know to be the moon. Telling y'all, I love this shit. <laughs> so Wheatsy got pissed off and was like, I'll fight you all. <laughs> uh, yeah, me, yeah, bro. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I promise this is going somewhere. Just bear with me. I have to give you the backstory here. Well, in a continuation of the narrative, Siwa Kawada would become the patron mother who died, uh, the patron of women who died in childbirth. Sorry. So the patron of women who died in childbirth. Rightfully so, the Aztecs believed that women who passed away during childbirth had the same value as men and warriors who died on the battlefield. To the Aztecs, childbirth was conceptually equivalent to battle. A woman in labor was said to capture the spirit of her newborn child, similar to the way a warrior captures his opponent. It was believed that the child was sent down to the earth by the gods, and the woman had to fight and struggle in order to bring it into the world. The newborn child was a sufficient Reward as she was successful and emerged victorious in her fight against the gods. Now, the caveat to these women dying during childbirth was that they would become what is known as Siwa Teteo, named after Siwa Kawadal. Siwa Kawadal is often depicted as a bear skull woman carrying the spears and shield of a warrior. And likewise, the Siwa Teteo are depicted as the same. Baird skulled women with clenched claw-like fists, macabre bared teeth and gums, and very aggressive. So are they like the army of, like her army that follows her around? About to tell you. Okay. The Siwa Teteo would descend upon the earth on five specific days, according to the Aztec calendar. They were considered demons of the night and often haunted what was known as the crossroads. Now, they also were the ones who helped to mm. car carry the sun from sunset uh, back to the east so it could rise again. But the crossroads were places associated with evil and disease. Roadside shrines were erected to appease them as these women who had lost their children were believed to not only induce men into adultery, but also steal children, much like a modern day La Llorona. Now, in a peculiar... Uh, so there were hoes at the crossroads ready to seduce the men. <laughs> They would basically it come. Is, they would basically come to the earth on these five special mm -hmm. nights, and these shrines would be erected so that they could be, uh, you know, they could appease them, because that was like the night like men had to watch out because they could be seduced and like taken away or killed or something right. like that, and you had to watch your children because your children could be taken because the see what the they are are searching mournfully for their lost children. You so sure you're not describing Harry Hines Boulevard in Dallas? I mean, <laughs> I've been down it. I've been down it late at night. So, yeah, I could see the similarities. And I think there is a street that they call the crossroads there. <laughs> or something like that. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's so interesting to see how far back this concept of the crossroads goes to. Um, right. Because we all know the story of like meeting the devil at the crossroads. So yeah. even in Aztec culture, the demons congregate at the crossroads a certain night of the year. That's well, pretty cool. I, I just, one, of, one of the commenters said, hey, it's like ancient lot lizards. <laughs> 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 Five nights a year. <laughs> that, that it is. That it is. Five nights a year. You better make your money. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I love uh, uh, jumping off of what you just said, Ryan. I love how far back this reaches to get to possibly what are the origin stories of La Llorona? Where did she come right. from? You have this story being told of these women coming to steal children that are and, mournful and searching. And, and, and to something I'm noticing as we go along, because we covered Lilith a long time ago, mm -hmm. there's a lot of the same aspects of Lilith that are being adopted for La Llorona. 
there is are showing up there's, there's also a lot of aspects of medusa as well which mm -hmm. like the the snakes and the wearing of the jewelry of the deceased you know in some form or fashion and you know having children that sprang from her womb mm -hmm. so yeah hmm. and the funny part is is the metallic horse head mentioned earlier that she is said to have reminds me of what's it what's the name of that one ryan the christmas cryptid mary, oh, lloyd. mary lude yeah mary lude mary lude, yeah, lloyd, 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 whatever it is remember. yeah, talking yeah. About. where they mary carry, lloyd. carry yeah. around the metallic horse head yeah the hobby horse and you gotta head. battle them but anyway. a, rat battle battle the front door. <laughs> a rat battle at the front door on christmas that that's mm -hmm. a great episode <laughs> <laughs> well, in in a peculiar and unexpected turn of events, Siwa Kawadal gave birth to Michta Kawadal, who was the god of hunting. Now, Siwa Kawadal made a startling decision to abandon her own son at the crossroads. And according to the ancient tradition, she is said to return to the very spot where she left him, consumed by grief over her lost child. Upon returning, she is met not with the comforting sight of her son, but with a chilling discovery of an obsidian sacrificial flint knife. Now, the obsidian flint knife is the style of knife used by the Aztec priests during human sacrifice, sending a clear message to Siwa Kawadal. Well, as it pertains to the ancient Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, God, I hope I said that right. Siwa Kawadal was said to roam the watery canals wearing a long white dress and a cradle board on her back. Now, for those who don't know what a cradle board is, it's the board that basically an infant gets strapped to so that a mother can, can carry them around on her back. Right. However, instead of an infant strapped to the board, in its place is the obsidian flint knife. Yes, even the ancient city of Tenochtitlan had its own folklore during its time. The fable warns young mothers not to leave the infant alone for too long, for if they do, Siwa Kawadal, tearfully searching for her own child, will come and steal the infant, leaving only an obsidian flint knife in the crib where the child once was. Lilith. <laughs> she just gonna take him. That's right. it. Mm -hmm. Just That's it. gonna take him. Mm -hmm. Well, even more chilling than that is the story of the hungry woman, who many sources state is Kawatleku, herself, which is Siwa Kawadal's mother. Suffering from the need to always feed, Kawatliku was said to have had an appetite that nothing could satisfy. She would spend her time weeping from her hunger and thirst, constantly searching for food and water, and the gods did all they knew to be able to feed her. Well, despite that, her insatiable need grew so much that she began to grow mouse on her wrists, elbows, knees, and ankles. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Sources state that she became so hungry and thirsty for water that she eventually resorted to eating garbage and dead or dying individuals who wandered too far off the beaten path. Yeah, there was a lot of shit you had to watch out for in ancient Aztec times. Okay. <laughs> you got Siwa Coatl, the hungry woman. Who knows? La Llorona's probably in there too. <laughs> <laughs> They're all Siwa, hanging out. Siwa Teteo. Yeah. <laughs> Well, during this time in the Aztec Empire, the ninth emperor, Moctezuma II, or Montezuma as some know him, who reigned from 1502 to 1520, began to have several prophetic visions and omens leading up to the arrival of Hernan Cortes and the Spanish invaders in 1519. In his visions, Moctezuma saw the arrival of a man who would come to wage war on Tenochtitlan. These prophetic visions reportedly included sightings of omens such as a comet, which was interpreted as a sign of impending doom and the appearance of a deity coming from the east. One of these many visions, according to a few sources, was of a naked woman covered in chalk and dressed in all white. And Moctezuma heard tells from people who claimed to have witnessed this woman weeping at night. So he inquired about the reason for her sorrow and what message she had for him. And this mysterious woman was said to first appear at a lake. Lake Texcoco. I think I'm saying that right. I'm sorry if I'm not. Latex was... Coco, that sounds like a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> Lake Tex Coco. Okay. Oh, Lake Tex Coco. I yes. just heard. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Which this lake was situated within Tenochtitlan. Well, the ancestors of Tenochtitlan remember this woman as she walked the streets wailing, quote, my children, we must flee far away from the city. Now, this is around 10 years prior to the arrival of Cortez in Mexico. Right. And she was also said to be the aforementioned Siwa Kawadal. And seven years after this woman began appearing in Tenochtitlan, a famine broke out and the alleged Siwa Kawadal made her appearance known again, this time wailing, quote, my children, we are about to be lost. Finally, all of these omens and all of these entities came together when it is said that the hungry woman, who could be Siwa Kawadal, the first La Llorona, 
devoured an infant baby boy sitting in his crib. Yuck. So that's how I get all kind of <sighs> boom. I want my baby back, baby back. <laughs> oh, Brian, no. Jesus, Brian. <laughs> there you go. Oh, God. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. This, no. <laughs> this is why. You know, you know, you know who you're friends with. You know. (laughs) This is true. We do. We don't know why we keep in people. (laughs) I don't either. Well, as the narrative (laughs) of the Wailing Woman unfolded in Tecnochtitlan, another pivotal figure emerged on the stage of Mexican history, La Malinche, Mm -hmm. whose role as Cortez's interpreter and advisor would intertwine her fate with the unfolding drama of the Spanish conquest and forever tie her to the story of La Llorona. While Moctezuma, deeply superstitious and fearing the fulfillment of these prophecies, was troubled by the arrival of Cortez and his army. He initially believed that Cortez might be the returning deity or the fulfillment of another ominous prediction. And these men were, ba- I mean, let's just be honest. They were unwanted guests. They just show up. Oh, and for sure. All of these people around there, they were like, oh, let's be nice and shower them with gifts. Not really knowing what was going to happen later mm-hmm. on. Well, among the gifts that were given were, I hate to say it, 20 enslaved women. And these women had been captured from their native homelands and given over to the Spanish invaders without question. And the women were baptized by the Catholic priest and all 20 given the name Marina. And and I think that this kind of just is a disgusting way of showing how devalued right. women were at this point. You know, I mean, not even given separate names. It's just, here you go, Marina. You're mm-hmm. all Marina. Actually, it's right. Don, Daniel Marina was the whole name, but a lot of it shortened it to Marina. And these women weren't just a uh, trigger warning. These women weren't just slaves. They were also rented out to right. gentlemen for reasons. Right. Well, among these 20 women was one who many have, kno- who many have known as La Malinche, to which I'm going to refer to as her, because names are huge for me. So I'm going to refer to her birth name as either Malitzin or Malinali. She goes by both. Let's go with Molly Nolly. I like that. That's the one I'm going with. (laughs) Now, reason being is because La Malinche is highly debated to the people of modern day Central America, Mexico, and and all of them. Uh, Many see her as a scapegoat who took a fall for the decimation of her people, while others see her as the ultimate traitor. She is essentially the equivalent of our Benedict Arnold. Okay. Like Mm. a thousand times worse. Okay. So her name has that negativity and connotation to go along with it. So that's why I'm going to use her birth name because I don't know. You'll see. Well, Mali Nali was born sometime around 1500, though her exact birth year is unknown. And she was alleged to come from some sort of Aztec nobility. She is from the region of Coatzacalcos. Told you one of those was going to get me, which is Mm -hmm. now part of modern day Mexico and belonged to the the Nahua people, which was a group within the larger Aztec civilization. Now, at a young age, sometime around eight or nine, Malinali was given as a slave to the Mayan speaking Tabascan people, possibly as a tribute payment. And it was during her time among the Tabascans that Malinali learned both the Nahuatl language of her people and the Mayan language spoken by the Tabascans, which was probably Yucatec from what I was able to find. Mm-hmm. Um, or Yucatec Maya. Right. Well, this this bilingualism would later prove invaluable during the Spanish invasion. And this woman was absolutely brilliant for her time. I mean, like super freaking smart. So by the time that Hernan Cortez shows up in the area, Malinali is fluent in both of these languages. And of course, we know she was given to, to a gift, blah, blah, blah. And she was later given to a Spanish nobleman as a gift from Cortez after she had her name changed in, in baptism. So within Cortez's higher ranks, though, there was a priest who would assist him with negotiations amongst the native people of the area. And it was quickly realized that this priest really only knew two languages. He was fluent in Spanish, and he knew enough Yucatec to act as an interpreter. So possibly seeing maybe a chance to rise above her station, if you will. Don't quote me on that. That's kind of my interpretation. Malinali made it known just how fluent she was in not just the Nahuatl and Yucatec languages, but also in Spanish now. And we are talking about a matter of weeks, if not months. She is fluent in Spanish. And she's been wow. immersed in this language. And, and yeah. there is something to be said for language immersion. You do tend to learn it quicker because that is, you you have to, you have to adapt and learn in order mm-hmm. to survive. Yeah. So, so now she's fluent in three languages. Yes, and she is the, uh, for what I understood, she's the only one uh, at this time that is fluent in all three. And how old is she? <sighs> well, she was born in 1500, and at this time they land in 1519, so she's going to be in her late teens at this point now. 
but okay. we're talking about g being given over to the Spanish and, you know, invaders and all that kind of stuff within that time and being able to broker the negotiations between Cortez and Moctezuma. I mean, it's quick that she learns that she was right. very young to have been trusted. Yeah. Okay. And as much as I'd say it for the time frame, she was a woman too. Yeah. So, well, after taking notice or finding out about this, Cortez realized her value and decided to take her back from the noblemen she, she had been given to. And from here on out, Miley Nali became a crucial figure in Cortez's expedition due to her linguistic skills. She quickly served as Cortez's, Cortez's interpreter, facilitating communication between the Spanish invaders and the indigenous peoples they encountered, most notably Moctezuma. It's with Miley Nali's help that Cortez was able to negotiate and reach agreements and alliances with indigenous groups who were opposed to Aztec rule. I mean, this man basically swooped in. He gathered information by mm -hmm. using her and laying low and just kind of, quote, checking things out, if you will, uh, to gain this intel for an all out attack. Mm -hmm. And so he went from like landing in the area to conquering in a very short amount of time. I mean, yeah, it was like two years, but you're talking about in the age of like not the technology we have. You know, in, in modern times. So well, he, two years, super quick. Yeah, he bought, he bought it his time until the time was right for the picking. And he, yeah, he, um, he took it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this ultimately aided Cortez in his invasion of the Aztec Empire and the capture of Tenochtitlan in 1521. Mm -hmm. So I give you all that backstory to kind of get to this. you got to know who Malinali is. Well, after the fall of Tenochtitlan, Malinali gave birth to Cortez's son. Some sources say she ended up becoming like a lover. Some say she was a concubine. Um, you know, things of that. I, she wasn't a wife. She wasn't yeah. a wife. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. But so she ends up giving birth to Cortez's son, Martin. But her relationship with her son would be short lived and almost non-existent. She was almost written out of the narrative by remaining unnamed in a lot of the documentation of the Spanish invasion. Eventually, Cortez took Martin away back to Spain and left Malinali devastated and grieving over the loss of her child. Now, it's obvious that Malinali didn't have a choice in this matter, but it left many native groups to see it as the personification of betrayal as a result of losing her son without acting. To them, it was the symbol of mistreatment and degrading parenting. But in time, however, Malinali would remarry a man of some nobility, and Martin would become the first of this, like, this admixed population of people from Mexico. So he was the first one to have both Mexican and European ancestry. Right. So in a case, Malinali is kind of the mother of the people, if you will, you know, because mm -hmm. he's the first, her child is the first one of this ancestral makeup. Lineage, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. the lineage that he has. So, okay. so you can kind of see how some people view her as this victim of circumstance who, who used her intelligence mm -hmm. resourcefulness, kind of make it through this turbulent time. And then you can also see how some see her as like the ultimate traitor. Because right. she, as some say, she could have chosen death other than help them out. And saved her people, but she didn't. So some of them see her as a traitor. Um, me, I think she was just unfortunately caught up in a turbulence. She was in a no-win situation. She yeah, did what she had she to do to survive, you know. Um, that's why I choose to use her birth name instead of the name that's kind of given with her. But so the association between Malinali and La, La Llorona arises from the perception of both figures as tragic women who experience loss and betrayal. Her stance as a traitor leads to feelings of guilt and remorse. La Llorona is often depicted as a figure consumed by guilt and grief for the loss of her children. Both La Llorona and La Malinchi are seen as symbols of the suffering endured by indigenous women during and after the Spanish conquest of Mexico. They represent the complexities of identity, loyalty, and survival in a tumultuous and violent period in history. Despite this, these two women are distinct legends with their own narratives and symbolism, with the connection between the two being more symbolic and thematic rather than literal. However, many sources state that La Malinche's story is reflective of the very first La Llorona, and since then the story has to continue to survive. Now, to me, this is because the psychological aspects and timelessness of La Llorona's of La Llorona that comes into play here, of why mm -hmm. she's endured for so flipping long. Well, the legend of La Llorona weaves a haunting narrative that delves deep into the human psyche, evoking a potent mix of fear, guilt, and grief. At its core, La Llorona's tale is one of maternal despair and tragedy. She is depicted as a tormented spirit, forever condemned to roam the earth in search of her lost children. Words are hard. 
This portrayal <laughs> taps into primal fears of parent parental failure and the irreparable consequences of one's actions, resonating with individuals who grapple with feelings of responsibility and guilt, particularly in the realm of caregiving and parenthood. The legend also serves as a vessel for collective fears and anxieties within Latin American communities where La Llorona is a cultural symbol deeply ingrained in folklore and tradition. Her spectral presence evokes a sense her spectral presence evokes a sense of unease and foreboding, particularly among children and those who are more susceptible to supernatural beliefs. Mm -hmm. Through her story, individuals confront existential questions about life, death, and the afterlife, grappling with the specter of mortality and the mysteries that lie beyond. And moreover, La Llorona's narrative explores themes of grief and loss, echoing with those who have experienced separation or abandonment. Her relentless quest to find her children mirrors the universal human longing for connection and the pain of unresolved sorrow. Through her sorrowful, sorrowful wells and ghostly apparitions, La Llorona becomes a symbol of collective mourning, reminding individuals of the fragility of life and the enduring power of memory. Interwoven with themes of betrayal and interpersonal relationships, La Llorona's story dives into the complexities of human emotion and the consequences of action driven by jealousy, anger, or despair. Her tale serves as a cautionary reminder of the destructive power of unchecked emotions and the importance of empathy, forgiveness, and reconciliation in navigating the complexities of human relationships. In essence, the legend of La Llorona transcends, transcends mere folklore, offering profound insights into the human condition and the depths of the human psyche. So which, as I said, I believe that that's the reason for her, her enduring story and this this crossing many different mediums because as i was like looking at this mm -hmm. we've covered a few cryptids and urban myths and legends and all that stuff on this podcast but i don't think any have transcended different mediums and media as la llorona has so the legend of la llorona has permeated various forms of modern media leaving an indelible mark of on art literature film and cultural events in cinema, one of my favorites, La Llorona has been brought to life through both traditional horror films and culturally specific interpretations. Most notably, or the most notable example is The Curse of La Llorona from 2019, a Hollywood horror film set in Los Angeles. This modern retelling of the legend portrays La Llorona as a malevolent spirit haunting a family and blending elements of traditional folklore and contemporary horror tropes. In literature, authors have explored the aforementioned psychological and cultural implications of the La Llorona tale. Some writers delve into the emotional depths of the legend, examining themes of grief, guilt, and maternal despair. And others incorporate La Llorona into modern settings or reinterpret the traditional story in new twists, offering fresh perspectives. Visual art artists have also been drawn to the haunting allure of La Llorona, which I did show a picture earlier. That's a visual artist right there. Um... The haunting allure of La Llorona, capturing her sorrowful visage in paintings, drawings, and other forms of visual, visual art. La Llorona's presence extends beyond the realms of film and literature, manifesting in music and television as well. Musicians have incorporated her story into songs and compositions across different genres. Excuse me, I have like the hiccups. While, the television, sh while television shows have featured episodes de dedicated to exploring the legend or incorporating elements of Latin American folklore. Even within the realm of true crime, the presence of La Llorona has left its mark. One notable incident occurred in 1986 involving a Texas woman named Juana Licha. I think I'm saying her last name right. I apologize mm -hmm. if I'm not. Enduring abuse from her husband, Juana mm -hmm. reached the breaking point and made a chilling attempt to drown six of her seven children in the Buffalo Bayou near Houston. Tragically, two of her children didn't survive the assault. But when questioned about her motives for such a horrific act and why she did it, Juana reportedly claimed, I am La Llorona. <laughs> that's what now she that's said. that's Andrea Yates. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was another one, but that's for a whole different freaking podcast Susan episode. Susan Smith. Another, yeah. not, yes, Andrea Yates, uh -huh. yes. And, yeah. Well, and that's the thing. That's one thing that I found very interesting. <laughs> about excuse me this story is that when you go to search and research la llorona you find a lot of uh the true crime narratives of mm -hmm. women drowning their children unfortunately mm -hmm. and it's just like holy shit like i don't i don't know it's 
it's like has it happened has it been happening like that long you know that that that's the because you know, we know that women are more of the cleaner side of things they, they're not going to like use a weapon they're not going to yeah more we're than not usually not. messy because right. we usually have to clean it up women are more poison likely to poison right, right. Mm -hmm. but right. this but this lady like juana like andrea yates things like that uh, of drowning their children um it just i don't know it, it I don't know. I've been trying ever since I've been researching it to try and put something together with La Llorona versus the women who take their children's life like that. And I mm -hmm. haven't been able to find it. I just find it fascinating that there is such a connection there, especially with the area with like Andrew again, Andrea Yates, the lady Juana that did the Stewart children in Houston. And then La Llorona being from mainly the Texas Southwestern and Mexico areas. I don't know. It's just strange to me. Well, it, think outside it, the realm. Yeah. it actually it actually is not that far fetched because uh, postpartum depression is relatively a, a new thing in the yeah. in medical diagnoses. So you can definitely tell that uh, this postpartum may be a new diagnosis, but it's not a new thing. Right. And especially women having multiple children one after another, your hormones mm -hmm. and everything don't get a chance to get back in whack. They're called the baby blues is what they were called way back when before they had the, you know, the diagnosis. So I can definitely see how uh, a woman with undiagnosed baby blues, postpartum depression, um, that uh, Anyone who's ever been diagnosed with it will tell you, you are not right. You are not yourself. You're, you have these incredible feelings of guilt. Like mm -hmm. everybody says, when I look at this baby, I'm going to love them. And when I look at them, I didn't feel the attachment. There's something wrong with me. Now, sometimes it takes a day or two. It's okay. If the second you lay your eyes on your child, you're kind of like, uh, it's okay. How is that baby? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I probably was too. My mother's probably like, oh dear God. What How did I that get baby? myself into? Like the whole first 24 hours, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> with me my mama that loved isn't, me that isn't <laughs> unusual it isn't unusual it mm -hmm. really isn't and and mm -hmm. the you know these new mothers are going i don't feel that in instant attachment there's something yeah. wrong with me a lot of yeah. new mothers don't and it's okay not to give it yeah. a day or two that instinct will kick in i promise you so <laughs> <laughs> anyway well the legend of la llorona cast a chilling shadow over the psyche of those who dare to explore its deaths Depths stemming from ancient mythologies of Aztec goddesses like Coatlicue, the fearsome goddess of life and death, and Siwakawato, who abandoned her own son, La Llorona's origins are weaved throughout history. The haunting tales of sorrowful mothers and vengeful spirits embody the anguish of maternal grief and the consequence of betrayal. From the blood curdling cries heard near bodies of water to the tragic accounts of those who claim to have encountered her, La Llorona's presence looms like a harbinger of doom. Even figures like La Belinci, whose complex role in history mirrors the themes of betrayal and sorrow, are entwined in the web of this haunting narrative. One can't help but to feel a weight, a sense that La Llorona's lament will continue to echo through the ages. So remember to tread carefully near rivers and lakes, for you never know when you might catch a glimpse or hear the mournful wails of the weeping woman herself. And should you find yourself drawn into her embrace, may you be protected from the fate that awaits those who cross her path. For La Llorona's sorrow knows no bounds. Her vengeance is swift and mer merciless, haunting the hearts and minds of those who dare to listen. That is La Llorona. <laughs> <laughs> that is about all I can find on uh, this girl. <laughs> it's very, it's, like I said, it's very interesting that all of these, like the, the bedrock for all of these urban legends have shown up before in a lot of the research that we've done. It's so interesting to catch those through lines. Yeah running throughout history and so. it's true i mean if you were to go back and like listen to mm -hmm. multiple like back to back of our our urban legends and cryptids and stuff like that uh, a lot of these mainly your miss urban legends curses right. even some of that a lot of them do have this same kind of theme that runs through them so mm -hmm. I, I find that fascinating as well especially I, I like that you pointed out because I was thinking it when I was doing research because I was the one who covered Slender Man as well. So I've done right. the research on both Slender Man and La Llorona now. Mm -hmm. And the comparison of the two is just crazy. Mm -hmm. I know. I mean, one of them, you know, is not weeping, but right. the association with children and the mm -hmm. closeness and the things that happen as they get closer or further away from you or, or stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, it is fascinating. So mm -hmm. it just shows that folklore which is nothing but more than just oral tradition, you know, kind of knows no boundaries. Right. And 
it transcends kind of across the globe because you can really look in almost every single culture across the globe and find a La Llorona type spirit or entity, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like I was saying with the Banshee in the beginning, the snow woman in Japanese you right. know, folklore, stuff like that. So what, what do y'all think? I think she's a fun urban legend story to keep kids in line. Um, but it's very interesting that, like I said, it's very interesting. She goes back that far. Cause you don't think that she does. Cause you know, I mean, everybody grew, grew up hearing about all oh, the boogeyman's going to get you. If you don't, do, right. if you don't do right. Or, you know, you better get good grades. You better do this and that and the other, you better be in bed by a certain time or the boogeyman's going to come around and, you know, yeah. and it's, it's so interesting to know that, that goes back even into ancient times. There were still people trying to scare the crap out of their kids with, you know, these, these stories of these innocuous beings that are coming to get you if you're not good. Um, well, that's what, that's what I loved about finding the sea with mm -hmm. the, the sea with the tail, you know, right. and, in Aztec times is it's like, right. you have these women who are sorrow, you know, have all this sorrow and they're grieving and they're crying mm -hmm. over the loss of their children from them being, you know, from them passing in childbirth. And then they steal children. And it's right. like, wow, that, I mean, I don't know what else to say. You know, that's La Llorona right there. So mm -hmm. is that a point where she started and originated from? Has the tradition of her survived this long? That, and I think that there's like, you know, these urban legends also prey upon like these deep, dark fears that people have. And what is more scary for a mother than to have their ch child taken away from them? True. So even going back that far, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 a fun cautionary tale. It's a fun urban legend, and man, I, that was really interesting. I didn't know half of the stuff that you were talking about, so that's that was a lot of fun. How about you, Shelley? Well, I I think it is very similar to much of what is, and I'm going to be a little bit of a feminist here. Very much male dominated oral tradition retelling of stories. The woman is the mm -hmm. villain. She's the villain. Right. She drowns her kids. It's not that she's been put in a position where she has no other choice. It's kind of like, okay, this is the best way I can think of to save my children and myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they villainize her for allowing Cortez to take away. You know, Cortez the killer to take away the child and she should have killed herself. From, what yeah, good does from, that do? From Molly um, Nolly. Molly yeah. Nolly, right. Yeah. It, it's this villainization and that somehow or another, it isn't the fact that, you know, La Llorona was, you know, the guy she was having the affair with, he gets off scot-free, but somehow or another, the, it up comes her fault. But being, a, I do agree that because uh, the idea of a mother being nurturing and that's why it is truly horrific when a mother does something to her children, I think that the entire idea of a mother committing that kind of horrible deed mm -hmm. resonates. That does strike for your mama's supposed to love you no matter what. And for a mother to do that, I think that is where the actual fear factor comes in. A mother would be willing to do this. And then of course, a as a mother would, a mother would regret it. Uh, and, and, Again, so it's also like, oh, she lost her children. She left them there. She abandoned. Were there a lot of kids just randomly being left? I mean, it seems like that kind of is the through line as well. I don't know a whole lot of mothers who just lose their children. Um, mm -hmm. Well, from what I was able to tell with like from the Aztec times to, you know, coming on through to more of a modern time is that it warned more so a lot of the stories that I found was like, don't leave your child in the crib by itself for too long while you, you know, I don't know, cook dinner or don't turn your back for too long. Keep an eye on your child. And that might be what the cautionary tale is, is to keep your eye on your child so that, you know, they don't get into something to hurt themselves. Um, because they say that if you took your eye away from them for too long, that Siwa Kawada would come in and take your baby and leave an obsidian flint knife in its place. That that might actually be more of not necessarily cooking or whatever. That might be like, don't yeah. leave them in the crib all day while you go out to right. tend the fields or to do your Go chores. to market, you know, go, go to, to market. market or, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I can go with that. But yeah, I think, I think that the terror in this tale truly comes to the fact that it is a mother figure, a mother who yeah. is supposed to instinctually protect and take care of their children and, this this one fails and now she's going to come and get your children if you fail as well or if yeah. she deems you to have failed yeah so i think that's what makes la llorona enduring and frightening and definitely something to scare kids with yeah 
I get in bed later on. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's and I I talked to a, a few of my friends who who, you know, I mean they they are from Latin descent, you know, stuff, and they have. <laughs> I think Ryan's being. Sorry, like that. It, sorry I think I, I think it's hailing. Hang on. A oh, okay. All right. You good, man. You I'll, good. Be, I'll be back. You good, okay, man. Bye. Take care of yourself. We All know right, we. I'll be right we, back. We, you good. We know you got to watch out for yourself. Um. But anyways, no, I, I even asked them that. You know, it was like, so what, you know, I mean, did you hear this growing up? And they were like, oh my God, yeah, I was terrified of her, mm -hmm. you know? But my my whole question is, is that you have these people, there's all these accounts out there, a uh, firsthand accounts um, of people experiencing things with her. So has the story been given so much power that she is now, you know, a, a thought form created entity? Because there's these alleged videos of her wandering banks, riverbanks, and hearing her whales and now granted some of the whales i've heard i'm like that's a bobcat uh because right. <laughs> you know if you don't know what a bobcat sounds like it basically sounds like a screaming woman i mean essentially that's well that is that is because cats in particular uh learn that they're able to get attention if they mimic the sounds of a baby of a crying baby mm. listen to your house cat just it sounds like a, a child i've actually been fooled by a cat that I sounded like there was a child crying outside. I went to find it. It was actually just a little kitten. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I think you're right on whenever you're you're saying about. Um, oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that train didn't even have time to get going down. I the know. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, that was really quick in and out. It, it is hailing, by the way. I just picked that up off the ground outside. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm so <laughs> oh, glad yeah. that you're okay. <laughs> yeah, we're all good. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I was, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. It isn't part. really hailing. That's an ice chip from your freezer, and you were trying to run the cops. No, off. <laughs> no it is. It, it, it's like, what, pea sized out there? It's fucking yeah. crazy. So, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'll ask you the same question whenever you whenever you walked away that I show it. Right, right. Do you think because there's videos surfacing and audio surfacing of quote unquote La Llorona? Mm -hmm. um do you think that she's been given so much energy at this point that she is some type of thought form entity now i could be i mean especially because of all this ain't like it's been existing since ancient times and so uh, like people passing this down from generation to generation for eons and everybody putting all that thought energy into it and it, it could have it could have manifested itself as some sort of tulpa that people are getting video of yeah i remember what i was gonna right. say Okay. I uh, there are actually um, videos that you can go and find, and I've there was one that was very compelling that I found when I was looking at this. You can go up and listen to the screams of La Llorona, and it's it's recorded literally in a street in a Mexican town, and I do not which know which one it is. I do not recall, and there is a man that is standing there, and all you hear are these over and over screams. Now, had it just gone once or twice, I might have said it was an animal, but it continued. Right. This wailing just continued. And it was the most awful wailing I've ever heard in my life. And he just records it and records it. And you see people coming out looking and then running back into their homes. Right. Isn't he walking home late at night? Like, real yes. late at, I, I know exactly yes. what you're talking about. I've and it, that. That, that, that screaming is horrible. But he, he's like looking around and people are stepping out there, looking around, they're going right back in. And it's seen, and he's even looking for it. He cannot find the source of it. He can't get close to it. I think he even God. says in the video that every time he gets close, it sounds as if it's farther away, almost like it's drawing him to where it is. It's like they get close and then they back off. He gets close and then it backs off again, almost as if it's luring him out. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a man, a man recording this. Mm. Maybe she was luring that old... Uh, cheating fool over here to his death <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what he was doing <laughs> hmm. shouldn't have been roaming the streets that time of night that's nothing but trouble <laughs> right there well i, I, mean, I think and go ahead Ren. i say well hell we roam the streets that late at night <laughs> <laughs> we do <laughs> if, I hear something wailing, if i hear something wailing and crying like that uh, i don't know if i'd go near that <laughs> no <laughs> Especially oh, if I was in an area, Shelly be like, "What is that?" I'm the no <laughs> Shelly, <Damn> Shelly would, <laughs> Shelly <Yeah>. would, um, <laughs> you would, but especially in a place that uh, you know La Llorona is said to be so you know prevalent or prominent. However you want to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think I go searching for that wailing and crying. No, uh, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. So no, I'm good. I think I'm good on that. Well, my, I mean, my final thoughts on it are that you know I think that yes, obviously I do believe that she is a cautionary tale. Um, I, I think she's a wonderful and an awesome scary urban legend 
you know, this, mm-hmm. this myth, but I, she is very ingrained, very ingrained in like Latin America culture um, and, and belief systems uh, when it pertains to like growing up from what I was able to like f- find from children and my friends and people that I talked to her. But I had some friends who wouldn't even talk to me about her. They're like, oh, no. And there is nope. the theory it's, that it's... you mention her name and, okay. and she yeah. will come for you. Yeah. yeah, there yeah. is that theory as well. Oh, they were okay. like, "Nope, I, I ain't." Uh-uh. And they were like, "I ain't talking." Nope, Mm-mm, I'm good. <laughs> it's like, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to upset you. I'm just trying to do research <laughs> for a podcast episode. <laughs> I know I don't get it. I'm just a little white boy trying to cover this correctly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyways, but that's yeah, that is the story of La Llorona. Very nice. I, I enjoyed it. I I love the idea. Um, I, I always like it when there's a female bad guy. I really like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like my but, uh, I, I think that this legend, um, most legends, things like that have a grain of truth. Uh, it is usually based on some fact, no matter how minuscule or small. Uh, I think that it incorporates every single fear that a woman, especially a new mother has. Will I be able to keep my child safe? What if something happens to them? Um, what if my, what if the father decides that they want someone else and leaves me, deserts me, or takes my children? That I think that that particular entity of La Llorona feeds on the fear of every female, every female, every new mother, especially mm-hmm. of now that I've had this child here, I've battled, I've had this child. Yeah. What if it's suddenly gone tomorrow? Yeah. And through, you know, and so I th- I think that this is something that has continued because it is very relatable to a lot of fears that many new moms, especially a lot of people mm-hmm. feel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely. So, wow, yeah, we're all in agreement. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> no, no arguments tonight. <laughs> well, in that case, why the hell are they stay around? Blake, tell them everything I need to know. I was, I was going to say, we do have to spend a whole weekend together, so we can't be arguing. I would <laughs> right. be doing that in the car. That's anyway. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Blake, why don't you tell them everything they need to know? Absolutely. Well, remember, After Dark with EVP Season 2 is happening every week on Paraflix Paranormal Plus right now with new episodes dropping every Thursday at 7 p.m. This week, we are covering the never-before-seen evidence of the Arkansas Tuberculosis Hospital. So make sure you have not seen that one on this podcast. So make sure you catch up on Episode 1, which is Hill House Manor. Episode 2, which we had special guest Mr. Chad Wandell on with Ghost Geeks. Absolutely amazing interview. And next week, we will have special guest Psychic Medium Diet. Renee on so another amazing interview Paraflix Paranormal Plus is available on Apple Apple, Amazon Fire Roku TV (laughs) Apple TV iOS and Google Play Uh, make sure to use our link to sign up which will be posted to our Facebook page tomorrow via our link tree and is also Mm -hmm. in the show notes for you audio listeners use our code after dark 25 for 25 percent off your annual subscription Again, that's going to be posted via our link tree to our Facebook page tomorrow morning, along with every social media channel we are on, our online merchandise store, our public investigations, and our Patreon page. Our Patreon page is the fastest and easiest way you can directly support the show. For just $5 a month, you will gain access to over 350 additional Patreon-exclusive videos. Your support from this goes directly to the show and all the ghostly adventures that we get to bring you week after week. This price will never change, and with that, you currently get our pre- and post-broadcasts, which are the 30 minutes before and the 30 minutes after this live broadcast where we discuss things further fight debate at goofy tell why ryan went to jail a couple of weeks ago uh, a lot more personal things sorry sweet melissa um, <laughs> 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 all right and it also includes our patreon exclusive raw and unedited investigation footage we've recently posted quite a few things up my dirty estes method at hill house manor was the last thing we posted which get your headphones for that and it's not safe for work so if you've ever wanted to review and watch some raw paranormal evidence, now is your chance that it's only on Patreon. And we do offer a seven-day free trial for our Patreon page, so you can check it out before purchasing. Uh, if you'd like to spend some time with us in person, we will be in Ballinger, Texas this weekend, April 12th and mm-hmm. 13th, for the second annual West Tex Paracon. Um, that one is family-friendly, so make sure you bring the kiddos, come out, have some fun, lots of paranormal aliens metaphysics type stuff is all going to be there we're going to be giving our presentation over a best caught evidence at the old park hotel 
We will also be in St. Joseph, Missouri on April 27th and 28th at SpiritCon at the Stony Creek Hotel. And finally, we'll give you more information on that as it gets closer. Uh, we'll finally, we will also be at, in Broadhead, Wisconsin at Broadhead Manor on June 1st and 2nd for Spirits in the Spring. We can see Sir Sexy again. It's going to be a lot <laughs> We <fun>. do. <laughs> we do. Well, these are just a few places that we will be coming up. So make sure you check out our pages for future Paracons. We'll be announcing pretty soon. So make sure you're also uh, head over and follow us on all of our social media channels. Search Everything Vaguely Paranormal and look for the green sound wave. These are all the ways you can directly support Everything Vaguely Paranormal. But we also appreciate your love and support for us through those likes, comments, shares, views, and downloads. And remember, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or stories you'd like to share with us, those can be submitted to us at the evppod at gmail.com. That is T-H-E-E-V-P-P-O-D at gmail.com. Like share and subscribe absolutely well we want to thank y'all for joining us for another weekly episode of everything vaguely paranormal for myself i am blake smith my partners in the paranormal miss shelly brett mr ryan roberts as always we will see you next tuesday bye y'all bye bye, bye. bye.